Hello everyone, I am Ranjit Rajeshwaran, Director of Murph Institute of Speech and Hearing and the Chief Audiologist in Madras Indian Research Foundation. Madras Indian Research Foundation was started in 1996 in the city of Chennai, which is the southeast coast of India. It hosts a lot of beautiful beaches and Chennai is also the medical capital of India. The founder of the institution is Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran. The presentation is divided into four chapters. The first chapter is on anatomical and physiological differences between the cochlea and the cochlear nucleus and its relationship to the implants. The second chapter is on the indications for auditory brainstem implant. Third chapter is on challenges and possible solutions in brainstem implant. The fourth chapter is summary and conclusion. Uh, if you look at the physiology of hearing, it's very complicated. Yet, hearing is the only sense that can be restored, even lost completely. Today, a child with a profound deafness can regain his hearing sensitivity using a technology called cochlear implant. And there's another sophisticated technology which is called the brainstem implant, where it's very useful in children, those who are even born without the cochlea or the nerve. So today, we're going to discuss some of the scientific and the clinical aspects in the auditory brainstem implant, specially performed in children with non-NF2, that is, non-neurofibromatous. Uh, auditory brainstem implant is a bioelectronic device which stimulates the cochlear nucleus directly bypassing the cochlear structures on the nerve. The difference between a cochlear implant and the brainstem implant is this very similar in terms of the technology. The only difference in terms of the device is the design of the electrode and the placement of the electrode. A cochlear implant is placed in the cochlea and the brainstem implant is placed in the cochlear nucleus in the brainstem. This bypasses the cochlea and the auditory nerve. It's very important to understand the function of the cochlea and the function of the cochlear nucleus. If you look at the cochlea, the cochlea is stonotopically organized. The high frequencies in the base and the low frequencies in the apex. When you put a cochlear implant inside the cochlea, the electrodes in the base of the cochlea will elicit a high frequency, that is a high pitch. And the electrodes in the apex of the cochlea will elicit a low pitch of perception. And it can stimulate along the length of the cochlea creating different pitch of sensation depending on the site of stimulation in the cochlea. Now if you look at the and the neurons corresponding to the respective frequencies depending on whether it's a base or the apex, the neurons carry the same tonotopicity through the auditory nerve and the same tonotopicity is maintained till the end come to, throughout the auditory pathway up till the auditory cortex. The tonotopicity is very important for frequency resolution. If the frequency resolution is, is very important for the quality of hearing and speech production as well. If you look at the cochlear nucleus, the cochlear nucleus is also has tonotopicity which is distributed by the auditory nerve which penetrates into the cochlear nucleus and innovates into different areas of the cochlear nucleus. The cochlear nucleus is divided into three components, the ant basically two components, the uh, dorsal and the ventral cochlear nucleus. The ventral cochlear nucleus is, is divided into two components, the anterior and the posterior ventral cochlear nucleus. They are not only different in terms of the structure, they are also different in terms of specific micro-functioning. The placement of the electrodes in the co cochlear implant is totally different from the placement of the electrodes in the brainstem implant. In the cochlear implant, the electrodes are placed inside the cochlea and it stimulates along the cochlear duct at a different, stimulating the different areas responsible for corresponding frequencies. In auditory brainstem implant, the electrode is placed on the cochlear nucleus on the surface of the cochlear nucleus. It doesn't stimulate the, all the frequency areas in the cochlear nucleus, unlike cochlear implant. It only stimulates the frequency areas 
on the surface of the cochlear nucleus which means the frequency resolution is organized more deeper so it is a columnar organization than the laminar organization so unless the penetration is more deeper into the cochlear nucleus it's very difficult to get a very high resolution um, of sound quality so this is is very important to understand because it hugely impacts the outcome. So it's very important to note the outcome in a cochlear implant cannot be matched with an outcome in a brain stem implant fundamentally because of this reason as well. And more importantly, the cells in the cochlear nucleus are little versatile. You have different types of cells and with different types of function. The bushy cells, the stellate cells, are located in the ventricochlear nucleus anterior as well as in posterior. And you find the fusiform cells only in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. And the reason of distribution of these different types of cells also important to know that the functioning of these cells are also different. Now, the output of the auditory nerve is very similar whether you stimulate it inside the cochlea or whether you record it on the um, uh, cerebral part and angle but the moment the signal enters into the cochlear nucleus the cells elicit or produces different types of outputs for example you take a, 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 a bushy cell it produces a different types of response compared to the other other cells so which means the cell inside the in the cochlear nucleus produces different types of output compared to the cells in the inside the cochlea so this is a very important point which has to be noted however though the outputs are different the stimulation pattern is very similar the way we stimulate the cochlear nucleus and the way we stimulate the cochlea are the same but the function of the cochlea and the function of the cochlear nucleus in terms of processing the information are totally different now again to insist on the same uh, point which I just discussed earlier this is the auditory nerve the auditory nerve enters the cochlear nucleus and spreads its neurons all over the cochlear nucleus. Some of the neurons go directly to dorsal cochlear nucleus, some projections from ventricochlear nucleus to dorsal cochlear nucleus. You can see projections from dorsal cochlear nucleus to ventricochlear nucleus. It's a very, very complex projections that happens in the uh, cochlear nucleus. And yet, but we are only placing the electrode on the surface and stimulating the neurons of the ventral and the dorsal cochlear nucleus on the surface very close to the lateral regions. Apart from the uh, auditory nerve, there are other cranial nerves which are very closely packed in the brain stem. Especially the area of interest is cochlear nucleus, especially near the cochlear nucleus. There is a other uh, ninth, 10th and 11th cranial nerve complex which is very close up. Now this is very important because while performing the surgery and also while stimulating the uh, uh, electrodes post-operatively. Any stimulation on either of these non-auditory nerves will elicit a non-auditory response, which could be painful. Sometimes it could also be fatal if it is not monitored and if it is not manipulated and managed properly. So that is why a very efficient team is very, very important in managing a brain stem implant program. Now, if you look at this uh, picture, you have the 9th, 5th, uh, 10th, and the uh, 11th cranial nerve complex, which is very close to the area of interest, which is the uh, auditory nerve entry route to the cochlear nucleus, this area. A canalysis for auditory brain stem implant was well classified by Sonaragulu in 2013. He gave two important indications. One is a definite indications and a probable indications. Patients with complete labyrinthine aplasia, Michel's aplasia, and auditory nerve 
aplasia are a definite candidates for cochlear implant and probable indications include hyperplastic cochlea with cochlear aperture and the presence of unbranched cochlear vestibular nerve the first option of treatment is cochlear implant with those with insufficient progress then we may pro go ahead with an auditory brainstem implant whereas in a definite indications the first choice of treatment in these indications are auditory brainstem implant but in probable indications the first choice of treatment may not be auditory brainstem implant we have to be a little conservative we give a first try with the cochlear implant if the outcomes are very insufficient then ABI is an option of course with the consent of the family in patients with partial ossification cochlear implant would be the first choice of treatment in a completely ossified cochlea ABI is definitely an option for the first choice of treatment being in a team working with auditory brain stem implant you have to face a lot of challenges one of the important challenges as an audiologist that we face are predicting the outcomes it's very difficult to predict the outcomes because of these challenges the first and the most important challenge is identification of the cochlear nucleus status now uh, and the this is preoperative challenge intraoperatively positioning the electrodes on the cochlear nucleus and getting a very uh, 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 classical electrophysiological response is again a bigger challenge post operatively establishing the stimulation boundaries on these children is again challenging because most of the children are very young and they have, they don't have any experience to sound and your first time you are stimulating them so it's very difficult to get a reliable response to set the stimulation boundaries and more importantly to discriminate between the auditory and non auditory sensations in auditory brain implant stimulation rehabilitation is another a uh, big challenge because every child is independent and the rehabilitation technique has to be customized for each and every child in our center the rehabilitation protocol for children with auditory brain stem implant is a minimum of 2 year program and this involves a wide variety of team members which includes the physical therapist speech language therapist auditory rehabilitationist and a psychologist as well now looking at uh, the major uh, um, challenge which is preoperatively is imaging the status of the cochlear nucleus so far we don't have uh, any uh, specific technology or a special technology which can give us an information about the status of the cochlear nucleus because most of the time we do surgeries on patients with aplasia a malformed or aplastic auditory structure so the biggest question we have is how good is the cochlear nucleus developed if the cochlear nucleus development is poor then the outcome is going to be very very poor if we could identify the status of the cochlear nucleus it's very easy for us or it will help us to predict the outcome which also plays a major role in making decisions for an auditory brain stem implant another important challenge intraoperatively is to is the positioning of the electrode on the cochlear nucleus because cochlear nucleus is a little complex structure and we don't have the entire cochlear nucleus with us we only can access to the surface of the dorsal and ventricular nucleus which is very close to the lateral recess so placing the electrode on the cochlear nucleus without damaging or without affecting the other brain stem structures is very important and the better the placement better the performance so if you look at the uh, this picture uh, this is the lateral recess and this is how the electrode is being pushed in to sit on the cochlear nucleus and if there are various types of placements that can happen depending on the uh, different factors uh, anatomically and if the electrode is completely on the cochlear nucleus which is very good so which means most of the electrodes is stimulating the auditory structure 
when you have a difficult uh, uh, placement where only few electrodes are on the cochlear nucleus and few electrodes are stimulating outside the cochlear nucleus, could be any of the other structure depending on the position, then the electrodes on the cochlear nucleus will give auditory sensation. The electrodes which is not on the cochlear nucleus will give a non-auditory sensation. So we generally call the electrodes on the cochlear nucleus on the auditory electrodes and the electrodes which is not stimulating the cochlear nucleus are non-auditory electrodes. So <clears throat> one uh, technique which will help uh, the surgeon or which will guide the surgeon to position the electrodes appropriately on the cochlear nucleus is an auditory brainstem response elicited by an electrical stimulus, which is an EABR. If you look at the EABR, the conventional EABR, you will have five peaks. But when you stimulate the cochlear nucleus directly, then you are expected to get three peaks in a very classical textbook version of the EABR. But it does not happen all the time. So you can have different types of uh, 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 responses. Now, if you compare the uh, EABR uh, in a cochlear implant and a brainstem implant, they are very different very different in terms of morphology and the latency of the peaks as well. So a, a thorough understanding of the ABR and the experience and expertise in detecting the uh, morphological or the physiological responses when stimulating the cochlear nucleus intraoperatively is the biggest challenge and the uh, the involvement of other electrical activity, non-biological response activities has to be filtered out. So you need to have a very good setup to record a very good EABR intraoperatively, as this is a very crucial process which will help the surgeon to position the electrode appropriately in the cochlear nucleus. Now as I told you, you can get different types of responses. You can get a good response, you can get no response. and this is how the morphology looks when there is so much of electrical noise inside the room. And this is a classical good response EABR. And if you look at the uh, responses, there is a lot of variability in the morphology. The variability, it, you can get a single peak EABR, you can get two peak EABR, and you can also get a three peak EABR. Getting a three peak EABR is very, very good. That means your placement is perfect and the auditory, so the cochlear nucleus is functioning very well. And in a single peak or a, a EABR, it's still good. You get a response, which means the cochlear nucleus is functioning. And while you do an EABR, there are a few things that you need to check because EABR or an ABR, there are two things which is a hallmark of it. One is replicability and the amplitude growth function. The amplitude growth is determined by giving two stimuli in terms of difference in the stimulation levels. So if you see a growth in the amplitude of the peak, then it's a true biological response. If you don't see a change, then we wouldn't consider this as a biological response. And another biggest challenge is while you're stimulating a cochlear nucleus, and especially with an electrode on it, there are possibilities. The neurons can go into saturation very quickly, depending on the etiology. So what do we do if we don't get a very good EABR? We do a staggered stimulation. The continuous stimulation is when the neurons are tired, you don't get a good response. When you give a staggered stimulation, that is, you give uh, five sweeps and give us a, a pause of few, so two, three seconds, and then give another five sweeps or 10 sweeps, then you can get a clear, uh, you can record uh, a very good waveform uh, in this. So this is another technique which will help you to elicit a good biological response. Uh, we did a very small uh, study uh, looking at the relationship between the EABR and the communication children, um, skills in children with ABI. We had 15 subjects and we grouped them into three. Uh, good response group where more than 50% of the electrodes are eliciting EABR. A poor group is less than 50% of the electrodes which can elicit an uh, EABR and no response group is none of the electrodes elicited an EABR. And note when I say uh, eliciting an EABR, at least a single peak EABR. The type of surgery was translab or retrosigmoid 
The duration of the surgery was average time is three and a half hours. The cranial, we used cranial nerve monitoring to monitor the other cranial nerve functioning. The implant used was uh, middle pulsar and sonata. The average time intra for intraoperative EAB was 45 minutes. And postoperatively, we used uh, uh, the CAP, SIR, maze, and MOOSE at 3, 6, 12, and 18, 18 and 24 months to measure the uh, outcomes. And all the subjects in all the three groups either had a cochlear nerve aplasia or Michel's aplasia. Uh, the results shows the latency of P1 is 0 0.86 milliseconds, the latency of P2 is 1.63 milliseconds, and the latency of P3 is 2.95 milliseconds. And most of the responses are elicited in the medial electrode. These are the medial electrodes, and also in the um, uh, lateral electrodes. We did not find much responses in the superior and the central superior electrodes. This is the um, uh, score comparing three groups, good, poor, and no response EABR. If you could see, the scores are significantly better in good EABR group and uh, no EABR group. And there was a uh, good uh, significant level comparing the CAP scores between these two, these three groups, but there was not a significant uh, correlation or, uh, between the, the, all the three groups when you compare the speech intelligibility rating, which is a very important thing because auditory reception is good and we could see a difference in them. But the speech production is not the same. Uh, there's no difference in it. It's, it's almost the same, not much of a difference. Now, post-operatively, uh, very important. We do the first switch on in a critically controlled unit where you have a physician standing next to you to take care of the patient in case if there is an emergency or a severe adverse event. I have a teacher and the mother, which is very important because teacher would exactly know which is a habitual behavior of the child and which is a non-auditory behavior of the child, which is very important. The mother is again a very, very important uh, person during the first activation because she could tell us whether the behavior of the child is habitual or even related. Now, if you look at this video, this is uh, uh, the first switch on video of a very young child. The child is hooked up to a cardiac monitoring to monitor the cardiac function. and. So while I was stimulating, you could see a very slight difference in the child's behavior, which is non-auditory. So it's very, very important to closely monitor these children. And you start with a very low level, go very slowly, one step at a time, to monitor the responses in these children. And if you look at this child, this after the switch on, was done. So we're giving a, 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 a stimulation. We give you a clapping. One of my postgraduate is uh, clapping her hands, and the child could see a consistent response. The child is responding to it. This is a very simple check that we do after the switch on, which is very similar to any cochlear implant. And another important thing that we always do after the switch on is we give some water for the, to the child, and we'll see whether the child is able to swallow it properly, just in case if there is some stimulation in any of the other cranial nerves, it can cause aspiration. So that's very important to check immediately out of the switch on. And the next important thing, we also make the child to walk mm -hmm. in, a, in a corridor and see if the child has any balance issues when we, after we fit this device. These are very important special checks that has to be carried out immediately after the switch on. And in case if you find a child has a difficulty in uh, 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 stabilizing itself, then we go back and then we reduce the levels respectively. And um, as I told you, it is very difficult to, for a child to differentiate an auditory and non-auditory because the child did not have any experience. 
Now, this is a video of a child who has used the device for two years. And the child has underwent an auditory training. And the child is trained to differentiate between auditory and non-auditory. The programming a child with uh, experience who can uh, differentiate auditory and non-auditory makes the job more, more easy for an audiologist compared to a child who can't make the difference. Now, this is a, a, a chart which has two figures. One is a figure for the pain, another smiley is a comfort. Whenever the child hears the auditory sensation, he would choose the happy figure. Whenever the child has a non-auditory, it's painful or something different from auditory, the child would choose uh, the unhappy uh, uh, figure. And So this is very important uh, information as an audiologist for me to establish the stimulation boundaries. Now another important point uh, which I have to highlight here is when you set the boundaries, stimulation boundaries, usually in a cochlear implant we don't care much about the T levels. But when you stimulate, when you, when you set the boundary for a brain stem implant, the T level is very important and M level is very important for them. So it's always better when we set the T and M levels based on the behavioral sensations. So if the after the once the child responds, it's painful, then I keep reducing the levels just to check if the same electrode is comfortable. Then the, when the child chooses a happy figure, then we set that this uh, the minimum level for stimulation. Then after we do programming, the evaluation of hearing is very important. Kinds of, I mean, uh, this is a regular procedure that uh, we do a subjective and objective. And ab subjectively, we use a free field audiometry to measure the sensitivity of the uh, uh, hearing with uh, brainstem implant in situ. And objectively, we use cortical potentials. This is very useful for very young children just to monitor the maturation in the auditory cortex as well. So we place the electrodes on the respective uh, montages and then we give a acoustic stimuli using three different speech uh, uh, stimulus. One is ma, ga, ta, representing the low, mid and the high frequencies mm -hmm. at different intensity levels. As you increase the intensity of stimulation, you can see the amplitude growth of the cortical potentials, which is a P1 of the cortical potential. And this amplitude growth is very, very important and it gives us an information about whether the child is able to hear or whether the child is not able to hear. And more importantly, whether the sensation is auditory or non-auditory. You give a uh, stimuli and you don't get an auditory response in certain electrodes, which could also maybe a non-auditory. And if you get a good response in the cortical potentials, then it's definitely an auditory electrode. This again another method, a cross-check principle to identify a non-auditory and an auditory electrode. And we also use the cortical potentials to monitor the maturation of the auditory cortex. So here you have three children who has got an implant age of 10 months, 6 months and 1 month and you see the latency. The latency is minimal as the duration of the device use increases. So which is very classical in, uh, for monitoring the auditory maturation in the auditory cortex. The, and then again an Another anatomical correlate is the correlation between a, a cerebellar flocculus versus choroid plexus. This is an observation from our cohort. Now, we looked at uh, uh, 25 patients and we graded these patients based on the cerebellar flocculus. Now, the grade one is non visualization of cerebellar flocculus with a prominent choroid plexus. The grade two is cerebellar flocculus, is hypoplastic and lying rostily with a prominent choroid plexus. The grade three is cerebellar flocculus, is small and more central with a small choroid plexus. The grade four is cerebellar flocculus, is large and central with a small choroid plexus. Now, if you look at this picture, this is grade one where you don't see choroid plexus, 
I'm sorry, the, you don't see a flockless, and you can see a, a much better choroid uh, plexus. And grade 2, again, is not much of a, a flockless, and you can still see a choroid plexus. The grade 3, you see the flockless is raising up, it's enlarged, and the choroid plexus is small. The grade 4, the flockless, completely covers the choroid plexus, which makes the entry to the root of base uh, cochlear nucleus much more difficult for the surgeon. And we looked at the twen uh, data on the 25 patients and uh, <coughs> 9 patients had grade 1, 7 had grade 2, 4 with grade 3 and 5 with grade 4. Now the factors uh, that encounter during the placement of electrode in grade 3 and grade 4 would be it makes it difficult to enter when the patient has a grade 3 and grade 4, which is associated with the addition in the lateral recess. More retraction of cerebellum was required for visualization of the root entry zone of the lower cranial nerve. The easier path was often found along the ninth nerve. The easiest entry was in grade 1 and grade 2 flockless. The 7th and 8th nerve complex was seen more atrophic in grade 3 and grade 4 group of patients as compared to grade 1 and grade 2. However, the ABA outcome were not correlated with the grade of flockless. But we looked at the vestibular function in the ABI in patients with uh, grade 3, grade 2, grade 1 and grade uh, uh, 4 uh, flockless. Now, Patients with grade 3 and grade 4 had vestibular dysfunction. Patients with grade 1 and grade 2 we did not find any vestibular dysfunction. And among these patients, there are two types. One is few patients, three patients had unsteadiness and one patient had vertigo. Now in all four patients with vestibular symptom, the cerebellar flocculus was found to be grade 3 or 4 due to which difficulty entry of ABI was noted. The more dissection of the flocculus, retraction was required for visualization of the root entry zone of the lower cranial nerves. Among these four patients, one patient the, among the four patients in grade 3, one patient had vertigo issue. And among the four patients, um, among the five patients in grade 4, three had vestibular, uh, um, sorry, the vertigo issue. So which means grade 4 flocculus significantly increases the risk of vertigo in patients with ABI. We also compared the long-term use of ABI in non-NF2 children. The aim of the study was to look at the long-term benefit using the medical ABI, which was measured up till 24 months. The secondary aim was to see the device safety. Now, we used Pulsar and the Concerto um, uh, implants in the study. The audio processor was Opus 2. We used the Maestro and the ABA placing system and the DIB and the MAX programming interface. The inclusion criteria was between 18 months to 8 months with bilateral severe to profound sensorineural hearing loss. The execution criteria, uh, the body weight should, if the body weight is less than 5.5 kilograms, then the child is not taken for surgery, simply to avoid the, uh, um, the anesthetic risk. The placing of the electrode array was not possible after former surgery, then they are excluded. The ABI or CI used in the contralateral ear was excluded. Subject implanted with an inactive ABI in the same site was also ex excluded. We measured the outcomes using these uh, uh, test protocols at different test intervals from pre-operative to 24 months post-operative. We had 10 subjects with average age of three and a half and seven females and three males. All children were congenitally deaf due to bilateral cochlear nerve aplasia. None of the children were previously implanted with a cochlear implant. The result showed a significant benefit at the 12th and the 24th month compared to preoperative in all the uh, tests. Especially looking at the little years, there were three among the ten children. There were three children who performed equally 
to a normal hearing child or a child with a cochlear implant. And rest of the other seven children were poorer than normal hearing child or a child with cochlear implant. But among these seven, three more children are very close to them but still not better than the normal hearing or cochlear implant. But there were two children who performed very poorly in among these children. The mode of communication, all the subjects prior to the implantation used either total communication or sign language. But after the implantation, they used oral and sign language. Looking at the channel status of all these children from first meeting, 12 month and the 24th month, uh, uh, one child had non-auditory effect on channel 7, which persisted throughout the study period. Another child who had a non-auditory effect during the first fitting and this was resolved in the 12th and the following thing, uh, the following follow-up on the 24th month. Uh, probably we must have reduced the current levels to resolve it. This is one simple technique to resolve a non-auditory. Another uh, 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 technique is to switch off this electrode. Looking at the safety of the device, the four subjects had adverse event and sorry, two subjects had adverse event and two subjects had severe adverse event. Among the adverse events, <coughs> one child had a fever and cold which is rated as a mild in terms of severity, is classified as device uh, not device related and was again reclassified not device related and resolved later. Uh, another child had difficulty in swallowing and this is probably the procedure related, but it was resolved with the follow-up treatment. Uh, in a child with severe adverse event, a child had an acute abdomen, a suspected intestinal perforation, and it was fatal, and it was not classified as device related. Another child with a swelling over the device, which is classified as device related, but resolved later. To conclude, Though the outcomes are not comparable to cochlear implant in most of the patients, 3 of 10 children reached a very good scores in leak and ears test. Low rate of device or procedure related events was observed. All children used device regularly having predominantly oral communication with supplemented sign language. The ABI is a safe and effective treatment in children with hearing impairment who are not a cochlear implant candidates. And another important aspect in ABI and the most important aspect in ABI is counselling. Counselling at different intervals and different levels. So serial counselling is important just to make the parent's expectation very, very realistic. And since we can't predict the outcome, it's even difficult for us to give them any kind of promises or any kind of expectation to them. So even as an experienced audiologist or a habilitationist, will have to wait and watch the progress of the child and the counselling has to be given appropriately, adequately to the parents depending on the progress. The major drawbacks of auditory brainstorm implant is a predicting or assessing the status of the cochlear nucleus. If we have a very sophisticated or clear technology which helps us to assess the status of the cochlear nucleus, it would largely help us in decision making process. Another important drawback is site of stimulation in cochlear nucleus. Unlike cochlear implant, the entire cochlear nucleus is not stimulated. Only the surface of the cochlear nucleus or the uh, neural cells on the surface of the cochlear nucleus is stimulated. And Another most important thing is a poor stimulation type and coding strategy because the cells respond differently in cochlear nucleus compared to cochlea. So the type of stimulation and the strategy that you use to stimulate the cochlear nucleus has to be totally different from how we stimulate the cochlea. So this is another biggest uh, uh, drawback which I think over a period of time we will be able to resolve it. The biggest uh, 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 I would say a paradox is we haven't understood how the cochlear nuclear works. So if we could have a clear understanding of the functioning of the cochlear nucleus, that might help the scientist to design an appropriate coding strategy. 
To summarize and conclude, ABI is now a standard management method for providing auditory stimulation to children where cochlear implant is contraindicated due to cochlear and nerve anomaly. ABI routinely performed in many centers in the world. Outcomes of ABI is poorer than cochlear implant. Though the speech and language development is not comparable, but the subjects show gradual improvement in language skills. The overall auditory performance in children with ABI was satisfactory. Children with ABI tend to do better than adults with ABI. However, the duration of training and the motivation of the family is a very important key and it's a very important key factor that everybody has to consider during the process. Though the outcomes are variable, children with ABI depend on the device and the quality of life is very much comparative to cochlear implantis. EABR is a very good predictor of auditory performance. And most interestingly, in very young children, where it is difficult to identify auditory and non-auditory electrodes, though they have a mild non-auditory sensation, the learning-induced cross-modal plasticity makes up for some of the advantages of acoustic information in subjects with no EABRs. More data is required to categorically correlate the outcomes. The experience of the team and the upgrading of the infrastructure is a key for the progress. The future of ABI relies in technology and data. One of the important technology that can help us in understanding and to overcome some of the challenges or event-related potentials and uh, functional near-field infrared stimulations. So which will help us to identify auditory and non-auditory and also help us to monitor the progress and the functioning of the cortex in patients with auditory brain stem implant. I would like to thank all of you and I would like to acknowledge Professor Mohan Kamishan, who is the brain behind the entire program and is a very great support uh, of this program. And the team of Murph Institute of Speech and Hearing has helped me a lot to put, come up with the entire program and also they've helped me to sum up this presentation. And most importantly, all the recipients who's been very cooperative for all the sessions, recordings, and their consent to publish this videos. Thank you very much.